the reader is the writer. It's like playing music. When you play music, let's say you're improvising to some harmonic structure in jazz, um, or you're playing a piece that's been played by many great musicians, you're listening very, very intensely. You never listen more intensely than when you're playing, just even just to get the intonations right. When you are writing a sentence, what in the world is your guide as you decide what to subordinate, where to begin? This very sentence upon which I'm embarked, which is so full of it. What would be the most effective structure for a sentence? That is a question. Determining what is the, finding the right structure for a sentence. You're doing it, it's like rubbing, when you're sandpapering, you're rubbing your hand on, on the thing. So I think that the division between the one who receives the poem and the one who makes the poem, if the work is passionate, good work, at some point it becomes a false division. I'm not, uh, I'm not making a product to sell you. I'm not writing advertising copy. I'm trying to write something that would make Robert cry or laugh or be moved, even if I hadn't written it. I'm trying to imagine me as a reader, only I did not write this. Would I stop? Would I want to read it? And most of the works that have seized me, the way, what have I alluded to so far? I've alluded to Kurosawa's High and Low. I've alluded to The Song of the Lark by Willa Cather, to uh, Yeats's Sailing to Byzantium, to the music of Dexter Gordon. All of these are full of mysteries. Uh, none of these, I mean, let's take the comedy of Sid Caesar. Sid Caesar certainly has to be one of the greatest American artists ever on television. He just made amazing live comedy week after week. Eventually, he was driven off television. And the young people here, I hope, have a dim idea of who Sid Caesar was. I hope you have some idea. Your kids will. Your grandkids will because he is a true artist. And if you have a child who has a child who's interested in visual comedy and in, uh, in comedy, that child will, I believe, will be familiar with Sid Caesar. Sid Caesar was driven off television by Lawrence Welk. I think most of the young people here have no idea who Lawrence Welk is. You don't need to. <laughs> It was silly, it was silly, easy music. And if what you want to do is make a lot of money, be Lawrence Welk. It's an easier way. Sid Caesar just loved, he couldn't help it, he just loved making things. You know, some of his routines were based on uh, foreign film. He, he spoke Japanese, French, Italian, and Spanish in such elegant double talk, that people who knew those languages thought they were hearing not quite getting it. <laughs> it's really true. To me, that is so much more impressive than actually knowing the languages. <laughs> that is art. That's the difficulty of art. Learning the language is relatively trivial difficulty by comparison. That is not easy to do. It isn't easy to take in. You always feel you're missing part of it. You aren't necessarily getting all of it. Kurosawa's High and Low, it turns into a policier, a detective novel. At the beginning, you see a guy, he's in the shoe business. He's worked his way up from just making shoes with his hands to he's an important executive now. And some other people in the company say to him, we want you to join us. We want to take over the company from the old man. The old man doesn't understand that we have to make cheaper shoes and he does it the old way. And uh, if we, you come in with us, we'll have enough money to buy him out before he knows what's happening to him. And he says to them, basically, fuck you. I'm not, I don't like your approach to the business, and I'm not going to do it. It then turns out he has just about amassed enough capital and is borrowing enough money to buy the old man out himself and do what they want to do, but do it better. While this has been going on, this is all like the backstory, like the first one, uh, Cornwall meets Albany, the beginning of King Lear. While that's going on, you see two little boys playing. They have American cowboy and Indian stuff or something they're doing. The phone rings, and the boy, it's his son and the chauffeur's little boy. 
phone rings, kidnappers. We have your little boy. We are definitely going to kill him if by this time, at this place, you don't give us this immense amount of money. Then the little boy comes into the room. Kidnappers had called and they said they had the little boy. The little boy's there. They realize he, they got the chauffeur's son. Phone rings again. Kidnapper says, yeah, we made a mistake. It's better for us. Because the penalty for the serious crime is if you are threatening somebody's own safety or somebody close to them safety, we're not, we're not vulnerable to a serious crime now. We were not, we're not risking a big rap. We'll kill the chauffeur's child unless you give us all this money. This man has a moral dilemma now. This is what his wife thinks he should do. The chauffeur, the chauffeur Japaneses him. He's so humble. And it's very fraught. And Kurosawa knows how to make it. This is not how many people's ass is uh, uh, Tom Cruise going to kick before he uses a gadget to, you know, it, it is complicated. It is worthy of your mind. It is difficult. Um, Cather's book is not going to be read by a lot of people on airplanes who want to read Tom, what's his name, novels about gadgets that blow up other gadgets. Then people fuck one another and then they spend a lot of money, whatever it is. <laughs> it's different. What we're trying to do here is different. I would go so far as to say it's more interesting. It's better because it's more difficult. And. Um, It's not an important issue. If it's interesting, I believe, if it's great, audiences don't care. If you're having a good time, you don't need to understand everything. Stevens, Wallace Stevens, people adore Wallace Stevens. He had contemporaries, you know, many, many more people now read Wallace Stevens than read, uh, what was the guy's name? He wrote the comic poems in the Saturday Evening Post, Night. Even Ogden Nash is kind of faded. The most popular poet in the history of America was um, Edgar Guest. He had his own radio show. He was like the equivalent of Bob Dylan. And people would quote, it's a, a great thing about the Cather novel, is she tells you, she keeps you from being nostalgic about how great it was and everybody loved poetry in the early 20th century, late 19th century. She enumerates and names and tells you about all the crappy art that people loved. The guy who commits suicide in my Antonia, they find on his body a copy of Woodworth, not Wordsworth, but Woodworth's poem, The Old Oaken Bucket. And uh, I forget the name of Margaret Booby, whatever her name is, who was in her tremendous hit stage play called Little Barefoot. She played that ingenue, she played that 14-year-old country girl in Little Barefoot all over the country, well into her 70s. There are equivalents around. That's not what that's not what the New York Writers Institute is about. You know, we're about just trying to do something the way Chekhov did it. How funny that I'm launched to a highbrow. It's something to do with the questions about difficulty that put me into this uh, lofty, uh, really a rather uncharacteristic uh, sermon about how good it is to be a highbrow. Thank God I'm talking about a movie and a comic. <laughs>